Good morning, everyone. That wasn't very good. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Shepherds Community United Methodist Church. I'm so excited about this message this morning. This is the last message in a series that we've been doing called Family Matters. And uh, it's going to be such a powerful message because uh, we're going to be talking about the power of the stories that are passed on through our families. And if you're, if you're just joining us, if you're new, you can actually go to our uh, website. Um, if we can get the slide here. And uh, if you go to uh, scumc.net and click on sermons, which is on the left-hand tab, and then go down to the bottom and click on the YouTube link, uh, that will take you to all the videos for the previous five sermons. But uh, today, we're going to be talking about how actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. And actually, our actions, after we do a lot of them, get narrated in our families... And those stories get passed on in ways that really affect future generations. And we're going to be talking about the power of family stories to shape our hearts and to shape the next generation. And so I want to begin this morning with a question. And I want to ask you, who made you who you are? Now, there might be some here today that will say, well, I'm a self-made man. Or I'm a self-made woman, you know. Uh, I grew up in a dysfunctional family, not me, this is just the example, right? I grew up in a dysfunctional family, and my mom and dad uh, didn't help me very much when I was 18 years old. I left, I worked two jobs, I put myself through school, I started my own business, right? And I worked hard, and I'm successful because I did it myself. Or I'm a self-made woman, you know? Grew up in a culture that tells me that, that I should... Uh, that I should not have a career, and I pressed forward, and I went to school, and I I fought against all of the negative uh, things in society that that, that try to keep me uh, from realizing my dreams. I realize that, and I'm a self-made woman. And I want to say this morning that there's something to be said for the decisions that we make. And I do believe that one of the most important factors in who we become are the decisions that we make for ourselves. But I want to tell you, none of us grow up in utter isolation. I mean, even Tarzan had the animals to help raise him, right? I mean, no no, no one's raised in total isolation. We all start as helpless little babies that are dependent upon the care of adults. So if you were cared for by an adult growing up, raise your hand. If you don't raise your hand, you're not telling the truth. Everybody here grew up with adult caregivers. And the emotional and spiritual health of those people had a lot to do with making you are, making you who you are. They affected you. Their actions affected you. And uh, even if you grew up in a dysfunctional, abusive family, the stories passed on affected you. Because let's say that you say to yourself, I'm never going to to be like my parents. I'm never going to treat my kids in that way. Even if you're saying that, you're still defining yourself over and against the stories that you lived. And so it doesn't matter whether you grow up in a traditional nuclear family, if you were in a foster home, if you were adopted, if you had a grandparent or an older brother and sister raise you, it doesn't matter what kind of family that you grew up in. The fact of the matter is, The actions of those who cared for you influenced who you became. And uh, and in fact, those actions uh, get crystallized into stories and passed down from one generation to the next. And those stories affect us in very, very powerful ways. In fact, there are some philosophers and theologians who say that our entire identity is constructed by narratives. That the way you see yourself, the way that you see the world, the way that you see everyone around you, your values, how you move forward, how you deal with tragedy, how you deal with conflict, how you treat your enemies, everything about your identity, say some philosophers and theologians, is a construct of all of the stories that you tell about yourself, the stories that other people tell about you, and the stories that you tell of others. And so they form this complex, interrelated web that comes together. They all get woven 
into one fabric, and that becomes almost like a pair of glasses that you put on through which you see everything, including yourself when you look into the mirror. Now, you don't have to completely buy in to the theory of narrative identity, but I'm sure that you will agree that the stories passed on from one generation to the next have an impact and have had an impact on you. If you believe that, say amen. And so uh, I want you to think about some stories that have been passed on to you that have influenced the kind of person that you've become. Now I'm just going to share a couple of mine this morning to get you started, and then I want you to begin to think about your own. Um, one is of my maternal grandfather. I call him my, my Grandpa Moran. Now, I never met my Grandpa Moran because he died of a massive stroke before I was born. But I feel like I have a snapshot of who he was because of the stories that have been passed on from my mother and my Aunt Betty. Um, and in fact, there were a lot of stories I didn't know about my grandfather, and I went on a long trip when I was in Tennessee with my Aunt Betty, and we were in the car for a very long time, and she told me all kinds of stories. And here are some things that I know about him, even though I didn't meet him. Number one, he was Irish, which by default meant he had a quick temper, right? Um, he was... Uh, uh, he was hardworking, he was charismatic, and, uh, and, and his job was a fruit picker in the orange groves of Lakeland. Now, now prior to, uh, to recent times, the, that job was not, uh, was not a migrant worker job. It was considered to be a respectable job, but it was not a high-paying job, and it was reserved for people that didn't have a college education. And it was hard work and dangerous work. In fact, my mother told me a story about my dad trying to go and work with my grandfather in the orange groves. He lasted one day. He got so cut up and bruised doing this job that he didn't go back. And so he became a night watchman instead <laughs> to earn extra money. Um, but, but I learned a lot about my grandfather because even though he worked what some might call a menial job, he didn't lollygag around and expect someone to hand him a paycheck. He didn't just get by, you know. He didn't just say, this isn't a career path for me, and so I'll just kind of do what I need to do to get by and draw that paycheck. No, even in this job, he wanted to become the, the best fruit picker in town. And one of the stories that I've heard about my, my grandfather, Moran, is that he actually competed in a statewide fruit picking contest and was given the number one place of the fastest fruit picker in the state of Florida. And, and his brother, JB, was the fastest clipper. And so he would pick them, and JB would clip them, right? And, uh, and so I learned a lot about my grandfather through these stories. And let me tell you, there were a lot of bad stories, too. My grandfather, Moran, uh, was an alcoholic, and he was an abusive guy. He was a violent guy. He was a fighter. But after hearing those stories, it helped me to realize a little bit more about who I am and where I come from, all of the good things about me and all of uh, what politically correct people call growing edges, right? Uh, it helped me to understand myself better hearing these stories because I got some of the personality traits of my grandfather. And it also gave me a couple of really important values that I would take into the future that would guide my action as I got a job. And so one of the things that I pride myself in is working hard, you know, working, doing my absolute best. And you've heard me talk about that here and the importance of, of pursuing excellence. That's part of how I was raised in my family. And then on my, on my dad's side, my paternal grandmother and grandfather, they had stories that impacted me too. And, uh, and my grandma on my dad's side, her father was a sharecropper in Georgia. They were so poor they didn't own their own land, they had to work somebody else's land. And, and they moved to, uh, to Lakeland, to central Florida, and the Great Depression hit, and my grandmother had to drop out of school in seventh grade and get a job at a fruit packing plant. My grandfather worked very hard he grew up in a family of farmers, and while they owned their own land, he was still very poor. And during the Great Depression, there were times where he worked for a dollar a day, right here in Lakeland, a dollar a day. And I've heard stories about how my grandmother and grandfather, they were only able to survive because of a community garden provided by the Salvation Army that would allow them to, to grow food for, uh, for themselves and for their family. And so, and so there's all kinds of things that this story tells me about myself as well, because they were so poor, they emphasized to their kids the importance of a college education. And so did you know that my father, his two brothers, and his sister all went to college? My dad got a master's degree in accounting. And I stand before you second generation with two master's degrees, one from Vanderbilt, one from Emory. 
But I wouldn't be where I am today had I not had those values passed on to me from my family. And so those stories tell me about hard work, the importance of a good education. My grandfather, even though they were, they were very, very poor, he never borrowed a dime that he didn't absolutely need to survive. That tells me a lot about how to manage my money. And so all of these stories that have been passed down from generation to generation have had a tremendous impact on me. And as I tell these stories, my nephews are sitting right there, and they're going to get these stories too about their family. And so I want you to think about the stories that have impacted you. Because I know that you have some too. I know that you have stories that have been passed on to you that have affected who you are. Now, I'm not as naive enough to think that they're all good. There are stories that we are ashamed of. There are stories that we don't want to tell because it might embarrass us to be associated with those people. (laughs) Right? And so uh, maybe there are stories of moral turpitude. Maybe there are stories of dysfunction and abuse. And there are certain stories that you don't want to tell. Those stories impact you. But there are also good stories. Even if most of your stories are bad, there's got to be at least one good story that makes you proud to be a part of your family, that makes you proud of your heritage, that helps make you who you are and influence your actions into the future. And so... I want to ask one question this morning that's going to guide the whole message. Are you ready? This is really, really important, okay? Because if you don't don't ask yourself any other question, this is the question I want you to ask yourself. What is the moral of your story? Not what's the moral of somebody else's story. What is the moral of your story? What story are people telling about you? What story will people tell about you after you're gone? And how is that story going to either positively or negatively impact future generations? Because your actions will inevitably be narrated. You don't have the option of saying, I'm going to hit the mute button when it comes to my story. (laughs) It's not going to happen. People are going to tell stories about you and the way that you acted. People are going to pass on snapshots of the kind of person that you were. And so the question is, what kind of story is being written about you right now? And I want to tell you this morning, before we get into the Scripture reading, that if you've made a lot of bad decisions in your story, it's not too late to write a new ending. It doesn't matter how many bad things that you've done. It doesn't matter how off track you've got. Your story is not over yet. As long as you're breathing, there's more of a story to tell. And I want to tell you that all through Scripture, there are people that have done some pretty horrendous things. You know, Moses was a murderer. King David, the greatest king of Israel, was an adulterer and a murderer. Paul, the apostle Paul, was a serial killer. And they did some pretty bad things. But that's not what we remember them for. Amen? Say amen if that's good news to you. That's not what we remember them for. We remember them for the way that they responded to those those bad deeds and tragedies, and how they move forward in a way that would glorify God. And so no matter where you are in your story, no matter what kind of story is being written of you this morning, you can change the ending. Say amen if you believe that. You can change the ending. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to go to the Bible, and I want to tell you a story, a family story, that spans the course of 60 years and takes up about two-thirds of the book of Genesis. It's a story that starts with Abraham and goes all the way through to Joseph. And I'm going to focus on the story of Joseph, then I'm going to backtrack and focus on the story of Jacob and Esau. And I'm going to show you how the story from one generation impacts the future generation. It's a very, very clear biblical example of this. And so we're not going to be reading the whole story. We wouldn't have time to even just read and then close the Bible and go home. We would run over time. And so... If you want to take a look at this for yourself, it starts about Genesis 15 and it goes through 50. And I'm going to be taking these two stories and hitting the highlights to just, just to kind of emphasize the point of how family stories impact future generations. And so I want to start by looking at this family tree. Now this might be hard to see. It looks like uh, maybe some of the font that I used didn't carry over. But uh, if you know your biblical history, this is going to be old hat, you know, but if you're, if you're new to the faith and you haven't read a lot of the stories in Genesis, I want to help you out a little bit just by setting the context 
uh, of this family tree. So it starts with Abraham, and Abraham is called out by God to leave his home country and to go to a new land. And when he's obedient, God meets him and makes a covenant with him. And part of that covenant includes he's going to have a son, and his son is going to be Isaac. Okay, so Abraham and, Sarah ha- uh, Abraham and Sarah have Isaac, and Isaac is the child of promise. The covenant that God makes is that, is that through Isaac, through his oldest son, he is going to have descendants that will be more numerous than the stars in the sky, and that everybody will be blessed through this son, this child of promise. And, uh, and so Isaac goes on, and he meets his wife, Rebekah, and they have twins, Esau and Jacob. Now, uh, they're twins, but Esau came out first, so in, ancient, in the ancient world, he's considered to be the oldest son. And then Jacob goes on to marry his cousins, don't judge, marry his cousins, Leah and Rachel, okay? And between Leah and Rachel and a couple of slave girls, he has 12 sons of his own and one daughter. And the, the, the 11th son is Joseph, and that's the story that I want to begin with uh, today. So, uh, I want to set the context by telling you that Joseph had a lot of brothers, and they all hated his guts. <laughs> and, and they hated his guts for a couple different reasons. Number one, uh, Joseph is Jacob's uh, favorite son. And his other brothers were jealous of this fact because it was obvious that he was the favorite. And, uh, and in addition to that, um, uh, Joseph was a dreamer, and he kept having these dreams that one day all of his brothers were going to bow down to him. And he made the terrible mistake of actually telling his brothers about these dreams, right? It's like, come on, Joe, you can at least keep it to yourself for a while, right? Uh, you don't have to go spreading it around. But he wasn't, he wasn't ashamed to tell, the, tell about the dreams that he was having. And so they didn't like him because they thought he was arrogant. They thought that he was going to try to rule over them. And, of course, Reuben was the oldest brother. He was the one that was supposed to be in charge. So you can imagine that he took uh, special offense to all of this. And in addition to these two reasons, Joseph would often, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, Jacob would often send Joseph out to check on his brothers because they would go out and they would, they would do various things, and a lot of times they were up to no good. And so, and, so, uh, and so Jacob would send Joseph out, and he would ask him to report back. And a lot of times the reports that J- Joseph gave were not good reports. And so his brothers would get really, really mad at him, and they essentially felt that he was a narc. And so, uh, and so one day... Uh, uh, Jacob says, Joseph, I want you to go check on your brothers. And, and at this point in the story, they're fed up with him. His brothers are just fed up. And so he hunts around. They're not where they say they were going to be, uh, which is pretty typical of his brothers. But, but Joseph uh, asks around. He finds out where his brothers are, and he goes to them. And as they see him coming on the horizon, they start plotting to kill him. Or they're just fed up. Right? So here comes this dreamer. And, uh, and, and this is what the Bible actually says in Genesis 37, 19, and 20. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Now his brother said this about Joseph, but I want to tell you that oftentimes the devil says this about us. You start capturing a dream from God. And uh, the enemy doesn't like it. But this is where it all starts, right here. Let's kill him. His oldest brother, Reuben, objected. He said, well, we probably shouldn't kill him. That wouldn't be right. Let's just throw him in a pit and leave him there for a while to teach him a lesson. And the brother said, well, we can at least get him in the pit. Then we'll decide what to do with him. So as soon as Joseph arrives, they strip him of his fancy robe, which in the story is a symbol of his father's approval, his father's favor. They strip him of this robe, they beat him, they throw him in the pit, and then they sit down to eat lunch. Nice guys, right? And, uh, and as they're eating, Reuben kind of wanders off, and, and during that time, there is um, a caravan of merchants that are coming through that area, heading to Egypt uh, to sell some goods. And as Reuben is, is absent, the oldest brother is absent, the, bro- the other brothers negotiate with the merchants and essentially sell Joseph into slavery, They take him to Egypt, and he goes to work for a guy named Potiphar. And uh, and they were able to cover up this horrible plot by taking Joseph's robe 
and putting animal blood on it, taking it back to their father and saying, we're so sorry, Dad, but your favorite son was eaten by a lion or a bear or a tiger, whatever the case might be, that he was devoured by a wild animal. And so uh, Joseph was 17 years old when this happened. 17. And, and even at 17, he proved to be an outstanding manager and administrator. And in fact, things went so well serving in Potiphar's house. And you have to remember, Potiphar was, uh, was a man that had some pretty high ranking in the Egyptian world. Um, and he went to work for Potiphar, and he did so well and got such good results for him as a slave that Potiphar actually put his whole household under Jacob's management. I'm sorry, Joseph's management. Okay? And so he's doing really, really well. But, but, and you would think, well, great, you know, Joseph has been redeemed. His life has gone from really, really bad to really, really good. But then we read in the Bible that Joseph was a very handsome man. And Potiphar's wife got the hots for him. And so very subtly, Potiphar's wife kept coming up and saying, hey, Joe, you know, you want to go over here behind the, the water fountain? Right? And it was really subtle at first. That's how all affairs start, right? It starts with a little flirting, and, and Joseph rebuffs her advances, and she gets more and more determined. And it says at some point in the story, she gets so out of control and obsessed with Joseph that she literally grabs him and shakes him and says, come on, man, let's do it. And he spins away like Emmett Smith. And, and as he's spinning, she grabs hold of his outer garment and takes it off of his body as Joseph runs away. And then, as if this poor guy had not been through enough, she goes and tells everybody that he raped her. Potiphar gets furious, puts him in the dungeon, which is much different than the prisons that we have today. Uh, you didn't have a trial in the dungeon. You, you went in the dungeon, and usually people forgot about you, and that's where you died. It's darkness. It's almost like being in solitary confinement for your whole life. It's horrible. It's like one of the worst forms of torture. It would drive any person absolutely crazy. He's thrown into the dungeon, and there he sits for a very, very long time. Eventually, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker make him really mad, and he throws them into the dungeon. And when they get there, they both have a dream that they can't interpret. And Joseph sees this as an opportunity, and he says, I will interpret your dream. And he tells the cupbearer, you're going to be in here for three days, and then you're going to be restored to your position with Pharaoh. He tells the baker, you're getting out in three days, but you're going to be hung to death. And he goes back and he tells the cupbearer, when you get out, don't forget me. Tell the Pharaoh that I'm here. Tell him about my ability to interpret dreams. Joseph was hoping, uh, he was living on a prayer, hoping that he would be able to get out of this horrible situation. And it happens exactly like he says. The cupbearer leaves and the Bible says that he forgot about Joseph. And so for two more years, for two more years, Joseph stayed there. Now it's important to note that even when he was in the dungeon, whoa, did y'all see that? locusts and stuff coming at me. No, I'm kidding. Um, so uh, it's important for you to realize that even in the dungeon, Joseph had favor with God and had favor with the people in charge. So not only was he put in charge of Potiphar's household, but when he got to the dungeon, the head, the chief guard of the dungeon actually put him in charge of all the other prisoners in the dungeon. And so even then he had favor with God and favor with other people. But, but, but after the cupbearer got out, he forgot about Joseph and, uh, and it wasn't until two years later when Pharaoh had a dream that he couldn't interpret. And, and, it, and it kind of uh, brings Joseph back to the cupbearer's mind. And he says, and I'm sure he's trying to get in good with the Pharaoh too. Hey, 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 Pharaoh, listen, I know a guy. There's a Hebrew boy that I was in the dungeon with a couple of years ago. He's a pretty incredible dream interpreter. And so if you bring him out, he might be able to explain your dream to you. And so you can imagine Joseph's surprise when his name was called in the dungeon. Joseph, are you here? I'm here. It's time to go, brother. Can you imagine the expression on his face? And they probably took Joseph out of the dungeon. They cleaned him up. They bathed him. They shaved him. They probably gave him some piercings, maybe a couple of tattoos. Um, seriously, 
because he, he had to fit in with the other Egyptians. He's about to be taken into Pharaoh's court. And so he was probably dressed like an Egyptian and pierced like an Egyptian and cleaned up, and he's brought before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh tells him his dream, and Joseph says, that's easy, man. <laughs> that's easy. What your dream means is that there is going to be seven years of feast and super abundance. You're going to have so much grain and so much wealth coming into your country that you're going to be very tempted to live high on the hog and squander all of it. But then, after the seven years is up, there's going to be seven years of famine. And there's going to be no food anywhere. Not only in Egypt, but in the surrounding regions. And so Joseph said, that's what your dream means. And then he took the extra bold step and said, now let me tell you, let me tell you what you should do about it, Pharaoh. Now that took guts, right? You, you don't give unsolicited advice to the Pharaoh who has the power of life and death in his hands. But nevertheless, Joseph was a bold guy. He says, let me tell you what you should do. You should start right now a big building project where you create huge silos that will hold grain and then go ahead right now for the next seven years, tax your people 20% of their grain and store all of this up so that when that famine hits, you will have control of the food source. And everybody in the kingdom will have to come back to you and buy grain from you. And not just the people in the immediate area, but people from the surrounding regions will be coming in. And guess what, Pharaoh? It's going to make you filthy, stinking rich. And Pharaoh says, wow, I like that idea. And then Joseph says, but you're going to have to have a really, really strong administrator to run the show. Pharaoh says, I pick you. He was so impressed with Joseph that he chose Joseph to be in charge of that project. And overnight, literally overnight, we have a rags to riches story. We have a guy who was literally in the pit of a dungeon, wasting away, torment day and night, to becoming, check this out, number two in the whole empire. He essentially became Pharaoh's prime minister. And the only person that was in charge of Joseph was the Pharaoh, which meant he had enormous power, enormous wealth, and now he's on easy street. And guess what? Everything that Joseph predicted happened, and when the seven-year famine hit, eventually it caught up with his family. And his brothers, who had sold him into slavery and lied about him being dead, were finding themselves in need. You know the old saying, what comes around goes around? And so their father says, you have to go to Egypt and buy grain so that we don't starve to death. And so his brothers find themselves having to go back to Egypt. And this is what uh, it says in Genesis 42, um, 5 to 7. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was famine in the land of Cana also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him. Sound familiar? They bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. They didn't recognize him right away, but he recognized them. So 22 years, 22 years after they sold him into slavery, they are bowing down, faces at the ground in front of their brother, just as he had dreamed when he was 17 years old. So the dreams of a seven, I'm sorry, a 16-year-old boy, the dreams of a 16-year-old boy were now realized at age 39. God will not be mocked. God's promises are true. It might take a while, but God's going to win. And imagine all of the suffering and pain that Joseph had to go through for those 22 years before he finally came face to face with his brothers. Think about what they had done to him. I mean, really think about it. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him up. They threw him into a pit. They sold him into slavery. He tried to get ahead, and just as soon as he took two steps forward, he got knocked 100 steps back when Potiphar's wife cries rape. He's in the dungeon. He's suffering. He's agonizing. 
all of the damage that their brothers did to Joseph, not to mention, not to mention the pain that they caused their father and their mother, who thought that their son was dead. These are atrocious acts. And you have to realize that now the tables are turned because Joseph has the power of life and death at his hands. And as soon as they bow down in front of him, he has the power and authority to summarily execute them. Boom. Be over. And some would say that's just. And even if he didn't want to execute them or kill them, he could have at least thrown them in the dungeon for a little while to give them a taste of their own medicine, right? But what does Joseph do? He doesn't execute justice upon them. He doesn't give them what they deserve. He doesn't throw them in the dungeon. He doesn't kill them. He doesn't even speak harshly to them. This is what the Bible says he did. His brothers finally recognized who he was, and they came to him and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Now, you guys, what we're about to read is good news. You ready? Read it with me. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. And then his brothers looked at Joseph and they said, what you talking about, Willis? Right? <laughs> Say, are you kidding me? Really? Because this doesn't make any sense, right? This is not justice. This is... Grace. It's grace upon grace. Brothers and sisters, let me remind you in case you forget, the only reason why you are here today is because God did not give you what you deserved. God did not give you what you deserved. God didn't wait until you were prepared to repent before he forgave you. God let you off the hook and forgave you so that you would have enough safety to repent. Because before you know you're forgiven, you're going to be hiding because you don't want to be judged harshly. And remember what I said last week. You cannot say, well, I want God to give me grace upon grace, but I want to give you justice, my friend. Here it comes, rolling down upon your head. Because that is an expression of an ungrateful heart and an unrepentant spirit. Grace upon grace. Why in the world would Joseph do this? It goes contrary to all reason, to all principles of justice. Why would he do it? And what I want to suggest this morning is that one reason why he might have done it is because he heard a story all of his life about his uncle Esau. And so I want to back up for a minute. And I want to talk a little bit about Joseph's grandfather, Isaac, who had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And even though they were twins, again, Esau came out first, and he was considered the eldest brother. And as the eldest brother, he had two things that were coming to him by right, by divine right, something that belonged to him. He was full within his rights to possess it at the right time, and no one could rightfully take it away. Number one was his birthright. And his birthright was equivalent to a disproportionate amount of his father's inheritance. The other kids got a piece of the inheritance, but the firstborn got the birthright, which is the disproportionately large uh, portion of the inheritance. That was the first thing. The second thing that the eldest brother would get upon the father's death, or right before the father's death, was a blessing. And in that blessing... The father confers all authority and power and control of the family to the eldest son, including being in charge not only of himself 
and his mother, but his brothers and their children. It was called the pater familius. It was the head of the household, the father of the family. The eldest male relative held this position of great power and influence. And when the pater familius was about to die, he would call the oldest son and he would pass his blessing on, and then the eldest son took charge of the family. And I want to tell you that Jacob, Joseph's father, robbed Esau blind. He robbed him blind in two different ways. The first story is Esau goes out hunting, and he's away for a long time, and he comes back, he's famished. He feels like he's starving to death. And Jacob's cooking a little stew, some red stuff, the Bible says. And Esau comes to his brother and says, Brother, I'm starving to death. Please give me some of your stew. And Jacob, a crafty guy, took advantage of his brother's desperate situation and said, well, I'll give you some stew if you trade me your birthright. And he's so hungry, his logic is kind of crazy. I mean, it's it's insane that he would take this offer. But but in his own defense, he was thinking, well, if I'm starving to death and I die, then that birthright's going to do me no good anyway. So, okay. So he actually sold his birthright, all of his portion of the inheritance, to his brother Jacob for a bowl of soup. Now, think about what that means. There's only two sons. So, Jacob not only gets his smaller portion as the younger brother, he gets all of his older brother's portion, and in this way, Jacob takes it all and steals it right under the nose of Esau. But the story doesn't end there, because then their father gets ill. He's pretty much blind, And he calls Esau in and he says, Esau, I'm about to die. I need to give you your blessing. So put your hand under my thigh. That's one of the ways they did blessings. I know it's kind of weird, but, you know, it was a few thousand years ago, right? Put your hand under my thigh, uh, uh, and I'm going to give you this blessing. But before we do this, I want you to go hunting, and I want you to prepare me a stew with whatever you kill and bring it back. And after we share this meal together, I'm going to pass this blessing on to you. And uh, Jacob and Esau's mother, Rebecca, overheard this. And, uh, and Jacob was her favorite son, and she wanted him to have the blessing. And so as soon as Esau grabbed his, uh, his weapons and took off for the hunt, she ran and got Jacob and said, Look, uh, your brother's gone. You need to go kill one of our animals. Make a stew, because uh, we've got to trick your father into giving you the blessing. You're really the one that ought to be in charge here, son. And so they concoct this grand plan. You know, Esau was very hairy. And it said that Jacob was very smooth-skinned. And so not only did they, did they kill what's called the kid and use the meat for stew, but then they put the hair on his arms and uh, put the brother's clothes on so he would smell like Esau and went into their pretty much blind father. And he pretended to be Esau, and it worked. He tricked him and once again stole from Esau what was rightfully his. And when Esau came back and he realized what, his ha- what had happened, he was furious. You can imagine This brother of his, his twin brother, nevertheless. And you know, twins have a special connection, or at least they testified of that. This twin had taken everything that belonged to him. He robbed him blind. Because not only does he have all of his material possessions, but now he has full control over the family, and now Esau has to serve Jacob. And Esau says, I'm not having any of it. I'm going to respect my father, and I'm going to have an appropriate time of grieving, and when that time is over, his head is mine. I'm killing him, and I'm taking back what he stole from me. And of course, in the story, Rebecca heard of this, warned her son Jacob, who then ran for his life to a foreign country to live with his uncle Laban. And that's where he married uh, his cousins, uh, Leah and Rachel. And they had a bunch of kids... Um, again, 12 sons and a daughter, and, uh, and they became extremely wealthy, filthy, stinking rich. But there came a time, because of a fallout with Laban and because of a direct command of God, that Jacob was commanded to go back to his hometown. Now, can you imagine what he's thinking? <laughs> uh, there ain't no way, right? Because if I go back there, not only can my brother Esau kill me, now he can kill my wives, He can kill my children. He can take all of my wealth. He can get his revenge. I don't want to go back. 
But God didn't give them a choice. He said, you got to go back. And so after, I believe it was about 20, uh, about 20 years, he ended up going back uh, to face the consequences of his actions. Now, he's scared to death, as you can imagine. And as he gets close uh, to, uh, to, the la- to his homeland, he takes a couple of servants and gives them a lots and lots of extravagant gifts and says, go ahead and tell my brother Esau that I'm coming home and just shower him with these gifts and maybe he will spare my life. And those guys come back and they say, guess what, uh, Jacob? Esau's coming for you and he's got a small or- army of 400 men. 400 men, yeah. And here Jacob is with this enormous caravan of women and children and servants and animals and material wealth and has really no way to defend himself against these 400 mounted armed men. And so Jacob says, well, we've got to have a plan. So he divides up his people and his animals and he essentially creates three waves of people that are going to encounter Esau in order. Almost like, you know, when the British... Uh, and the Americans fought during the Revolutionary War. They lined up and just went straight at each other. So uh, Jacob divided them up. And on the first, uh, this, is, this is kind of funny, but not really. Uh, on the first line, he put all of his uh, servants and their children and all the animals. That was the first wave that would be encountered. And then behind them, he had Leah and her children and servants. And then the third was Rachel and his favorite son, Joseph. Hoping that if he was killed and the onslaught came that he would lose people in the order of importance, hoping to preserve the life of Joseph at least. And so he set up these three waves of people. He started them moving to the front. He went ahead of all of them. And on his way, when he saw Esau, he's bowing to him seven times all the way there. And guess what happens when he meets Esau? This is what happens when he meets Esau. Instead of killing him, he ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And they wept together. (laughs) You see where Joseph gets it from? Because this story is the story of Esau sparing his father's life. And you can imagine this story was told over and over and over and over and over again to the children, including Joseph. And that story powerfully influenced the kind of person that he was and how he was going to treat his enemies. Parents, did you know that your children will mimic how you treat your enemies when they become adults? And so it's important to note the power of this story. And that's quite simply the message. I'm going to ask the praise band to come up. That's the message because what we've seen is a very, very clear example of how the story of Uncle Esau was passed on through the generations and shaped the identity and action of Joseph when he was put in a similar crisis. And I want to ask you once again the the, the question that I began with. What story are people going to tell of you? What is the moral of your story? What are your children going to say and your grandchildren say as they pass on stories about you? And is it going to be a positive reflection of the gospel or is it going to be a negative expression of your own selfishness and brokenness? Because you know that the stories that are told about you are going to influence your kids. It will influence the kind of person that they're drawn to as friends. Did you know that, parents? Your kids are watching you all the time. And the kind of people that you associate with and the way that you relate to them will determine the kinds of people that your children are attracted to as friends and later on as a mate. Did you know that boys learn how to treat girls and girls develop expectations of how they're to be treated by watching how their fathers treat their mothers? Dads, are you listening? Actions speak louder than words. And did you know that little girls learn how to treat a man and little boys develop expectations of how women should treat them by watching the way that their mother treats their father? Did you know that your kids are watching how you manage your money, how you deal with crisis, how you deal with conflict, how you treat your enemies, what you do when you're under pressure? They're learning it 
all from you because here's the main idea here. Your actions don't just speak louder than your words. Your actions echo for several generations. What story is going to be told of you? Now this morning, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes right where you are. This is the last message in this series, and we have, we have gained a lot of material here, a lot of ideas, a lot of things to think about. And, and I just want to speak for a minute to those of you who might be here this morning who are really, really struggling because you made some pretty bad decisions and you walked away from God, and in walking away from God, you started engaging in activities that are shameful, things that you want to keep in hiding, things that take you away from God. Perhaps you've never accepted Jesus, and you've always tried to go it alone. Or perhaps you accepted Jesus, but when the heat was turned up and the pressure came, you caved in, you relied upon yourself, and you acted in a way that resulted in a story that you don't want to be told about you, and you want to write a new ending. Now, you can't change the past, but God can redeem the past. If you believe it, say amen. God can redeem your past. God can help you write a new ending. And so this morning, if you've never accepted Christ into your life, or you have wandered away from Christ, and you don't like the story that is being narrated about your life, if you don't like the way that you're living, and you want a brand new start this morning, a brand new start that you want to say, Pastor Mark, when I get up and I sing this last song, I want to be a new person with a new life and a new ending. If that's where you are right now, with every eye closed, raise your hand right now. God bless you. One, two, three, four, five. God bless you. Six, seven, eight, nine. Hands are going up all over the place. Amen. Praise God. God sees every single hand that has been raised. I'm telling you right now, you can be a new person today. You can have forgiveness today. You can write a story that you're excited about telling today. Praise God. Let's pray. If you raise your hand, I want you to pray this sincerely in your heart. And even if you didn't, I want everybody to pray with me to support your brothers and sisters that did. But those of you that raised your hand, it's particularly important that you say this prayer with me because we're going to get right with God right here, right now. So repeat this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die for me. I believe in the cross and in the power of his resurrection. I believe there is forgiveness in him. And I sincerely, wholeheartedly, from the depths of my soul, repent of my sin. I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me. Separate my sin as far as the east is from the west. Remember it no more. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Set my feet in a new direction. And give me the power of your Holy Spirit to be healed of my hurts to be forgiven of my sins and to walk in the newness of life. Not on my own strength, but on your strength. I claim these promises in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. Amen. Praise God, everyone. I want you to stand and join me in this closing song. And I just want to tell you that if you said this prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time and you want some help, I have written a booklet called New Life in Christ. It will explain to you, using the Bible, the decision that you have made today and it will give you your next steps. And there are copies of this on the table outside. And so if you said this prayer and you want some, some next steps, I want you to grab one of those booklets and if we run out, then I'll print some more for next week, okay? But let's sing our last song and let's sing it from the depths of our souls as we give God the glory for all that has happened here this morning.